Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kate. All right, so, wow. Um, I've never quite uh, spoke with this um, kind of um, environment, so I might be a little bit nervous. Hopefully, I'll get warmed up as we start going. Uh, as, as he said, uh, I'm, at the, I'm an assistant professor. So I'm in my fourth year at the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering. A few folks have asked me what we do. I tell people my short one is we teach engineers how to talk to people before they build things. Um, which apparently is a good idea. Uh, and I, uh, my, my research looks at this intersection of um, uh, computer science and social science, and very specifically at the use of social media during disaster events. I want to start by having you all look at this, uh, at this photograph and, um, and think about this woman in a very funny hat who's got her, her phone out. And I, I, it, this, this photograph was sent a few years ago, uh, end of October 2012, on the East Coast. Uh, right after Hurricane Sandy came in. And this woman um, is, is, is looking at her phone and she's maybe sending a, a text or a tweet or an Instagram photo, uh, Instagram photo about that tree car interaction that's happening behind her in the background. And in you know, the wake of this event, there was a huge social media response, millions of tweets, tens of uh, photos per second on Instagram, uh, other platforms that were popular at that time saw a lot of use. And I, uh, I've been doing research in this space for a while, and this guy, he was a, either a blogger or a journalist, it's sometimes hard for me to tell the difference, he w contacted me and he said, hey, uh, I want to talk to you about how Hurricane Sandy was the first social disaster. Um, can you help me with this? I said, absolutely, I can help you. You cannot lead with the fact that Hurricane Sandy was the first social disaster. So first of all, everything about disasters is and always has been social. I don't think we would think about them as disasters, except for the fact that they disrupt our social lives, they affect people, people's lives, um, they disrupt what we want to do, and they, they, they interrupt our, our normal social dynamics. So disasters are inherently social. And ever since we've had social media and the platforms that came before social media that are like social media, people have been using these platforms during disasters in all sorts of creative and fantastic ways to try to share information and help themselves and help others. Um, so I've been looking at this intersection for a few years of social computing during crisis events. And by social computing, I... Um, I mean uh, all of these tools and platforms that help us share information with each other, with our friends, with the remote crowd, um, and, and not just the tools and the platforms, I'm really focused on the human behavior that those tools and platforms enable. And I look at them in a lot of different kinds of crisis events. So I do look at the natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes. I look at other extreme weather events like an inch of snow in Seattle, and I know what kind of disruption that can cause around here. Um, and, uh, and also human-made events. Um, and, and there's actually, at this intersection, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of things we can do we couldn't do before. So people can share information with their friends, their families, their neighbors, the remote crowd, with emergency responders, responders with journalists, in real time about what's happening to them on the ground. We're all armed with these mobile phones now, and we can use these platforms that we have to share information. And this could help people make better decisions, can enhance our situational awareness, help us understand what's going on in a perfect world, if, in a perfect information space, if we could get at the pieces of information that, that, that we needed. These tools can also be used by emergency responders to share information with their many publics in real time, like this evacuation notice that went out um, during the Boulder floods. And there's also, I mean, there's many other things. But well, the third thing that I look at is, is online volunteerism, how these platforms and tools uh, facilitate people coming together to help themselves, to help other people uh, in, in new ways. And I want to talk to you today a lot about that. So I want to start out with this, this photograph. And I want you to, to think back. This is where the, the US Airlines uh, flight, I think 2009, landed on the Hudson. And these are the res first responders to that. And these are ferry boats that were in the area that came as fast as they could and started helping people get off, get off that plane. And so sociologists of disaster have known for a long time that after disaster, disaster event, people will converge onto the scene and to, to among other things, try to help. And um, a lot of that, our first responders are often not the professionals you, we think about. It's often everyday people coming on into the, uh, onto the scene to try to, to try to help out. And more and more, we've been seeing that convergence happen in social spaces and online spaces during disaster events. And so I've been looking at digital volunteerism for several years. And I want to, I've 
take a, a little moment. Um, today is actually a really hard day. Yesterday was a really hard day to be a disaster researcher, and I actually want just, to just say that, that my heart is right now going out to um, the community of um, Umpqua and Rose, Roseburg at this time. And um, I've, I've been studying disaster events for a long time, and, and well, maybe not a long time, but it feels like a long time, and I've studied many events, and um, I, wanna, I want you to know I get excited up here with, about what I'm talking about, uh, but I know that these are, you know, these are events that have affected people's lives, and, um, and they, they can be pretty heavy. I'm going to talk today about three events, and I'm going to focus on sort of the, the cool things about humanity that happen during events. I'm going to focus on the positives, how people come together to, to help each other. And I want to start out um, talking about the 2010 Haiti earthquake, um, which again was a catastrophic event. Hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives, were displaced, there were tens of thousands injured, and in the wake of that event, um, people had a cu very acute need for food, water, shelter. Uh, the, the infrastructure of Haiti was pretty vulnerable to start with and it was totally decimated. And so, and so for, for many weeks, people were, were in great need. And I, like many other people, I had just started in a space studying disaster response online. I went online to, to try to help and actually um, with, with the folks that I was working, at at university, working with at University of Colorado at the time. And we ended up finding a bunch of other folks who were trying to do the same thing, use social media tools to help. And I actually want to focus on their stories because they're much more interesting than mine. So I want to tell you about Melissa Elliott, and um, I'm going to translate this tweet. I think you all can read it, but, but this is a retweet that was sent about a little, seven days, eight days after the Haiti earthquake. And she says, um, oh, Spy Doctor Media says, I, I am stunned. We have gotten supplies in, saved people from rubble, brought them doctors. We have the best team. We are volunteers. And this tweet uh, might make you wonder. Um, who are these people? Who is M Melissa Elliott? Um, and how, where was she? And how was she moving doctors around in Haiti? And I actually want to tell you how that happened. So Melissa Elliott Melly Mello was, um, is a, a woman uh, in Ontario, Canada. So I think French-speaking Canada. And she was um, affected by this event. Uh, Canada, uh, uh, Haiti, the language in Haiti is, is uh, Haitian Creole, but the second language is French. And so there's a connection with um, response and, and some other things between French-speaking Canada and Haiti. And so there was a lot of people at the time that were going online and trying to help and trying to help in other ways from that area. And Melissa Elliott went online and she was trying, she just, she wanted to do something. She cared about this place. She cared about these people. And so she started finding people that were from Haiti. Um, who weren't there and actually found people that were there and tried to gather up their cell phone numbers so she could add cell phone minutes remotely to their phones so they would be able to use their phones as the communication was going on. And she did this, she gathered, she had lots of numbers, she, she started adding them, she started recruiting help. She had too many numbers, she couldn't fill, fill them all. She started recruiting help online. Um, she tr started recruiting, uh, trying to uh, get donations online. And over time, after a while, she started meeting people. One of them was Jack Mel. This was a kid, he was 17, he was living in Florida at the time, going to school, but he had family in Haiti. And he connected with Melly Mello, he said, can you add these minutes for my family members? He sent her lists of phone numbers. And over time, she developed this connection to him and all of his family members in Haiti. And so, later, as she's seeing people need food over here, people have a doctor over here, he's wondering how he could help, she starts to connect this information through these people whose cell phones she has, she starts calling them and say, hey, I heard this, can you help? And she starts becoming a remote operator and for a few days before the form formal response got set up, she's moving aid around in Haiti. And she wasn't doing this alone. Um, there were other people who were, I mean, maybe not on a wide scale, but they were actually having real impact. And there was other people that were helping her. And we did some interviews and one of them said, uh, I think that's when I went on Twitter and started tweeting. Then I discovered a whole bunch of people tweeting for Haiti and started doing it myself and building up connections as much as I could in order to try to save some lives if possible. And so these folks actually came together in really fascinating ways. So I do a network diagram here um, of uh, Twitter users are the, are the spheres and I connect them with a line if they were retweeting or, or mentioning each other during that event. We have a bunch of Twitter data. Um, and we actually found that there was a pretty dense network. Uh, we, we selected users from some of the certain hashtags they were using. And among some of these aid-based hashtags, there was a, a dense network of people who were sharing information with each other and um, throughout the course of this event. So we went down back and interviewed them. And we said, you know, what were you doing? Why were you doing it? Who were you working with? 
And we talked to about 20, group, 20 folks in this network graph, and we asked them um, eventually, how many people in this network did you know before January 12, 2010, when the event happened? Um, no online, offline, I don't care, either one. Um, and we ended up, so three of the 20 people knew one other person in the network. We gave them a list of all the people they retweeted or talked to. They knew one other person in the network before the event. Um, but after the event, they came together, they started coordinating their work, passing off one piece of information to another, saying, hey, I'm in Australia, I'm going to bed, can someone in the US take over this request and call this person and see if they still need help? And so, this really fascinating behavior, and we see this, is, it, emergent organizations happen all the time during disaster events, but here we're seeing emergent virtual organizations to come, to come together in networks like this. And in repeat uh, events over and over again, I'm seeing other networks form. Um, some of the same people come back, but there's new centers of gravity, new people come in. But after every event, there's these group, these networks, and, and on Twitter and, and elsewhere, of people coming together to help out. And lesson learned here, the crowd is appropriating social media and online tools to converge digitally, to connect and collaborate, to solve problems during crisis events. A second event I want to talk about is Hurricane Irene um, in 2011. And I, I mentioned this, and maybe there's some journalists in here. Um, I mentioned this because it was a really interesting case um, where the, the role of a few journalists uh, maybe changed or, or evolved in, in, from what we saw. So 2011, Hurricane Irene was um, a dud event in New York City, but if you lived in upstate New York or Vermont, that storm actually got caught on top of those areas, and there was a, another storm came in at the same time. There ended up being catastrophic flooding. Um, whole towns were washed away. Uh, pe uh, a lot of the road infrastructure, the bridges were washed away. People were trapped. People were in need of food um, and all sorts of different things for quite some time. Family members couldn't connect with other family members. Um, in the rural Catskill Mountains, um, the communication infrastructure isn't what we think about. There's no mobile phone connections. Everything's landline. Power went down. Um, and so it, it was a very tough event. But if you were from the Catskill area, and I'll explain this later, no matter who you were, you were probably getting your information um, through this, uh, uh, at some level, through this sort of crowdsource effort that was going on. And my, uh, uh, maybe I can go back, sorry. I, I was doing this research with a, a PhD student of mine. She actually collected all this data. She was there at the time, she's from the Catskill Mountains, and she actually collected all this data. Um, Dharma Daly, I wanted to mention her. All right, so what was happening is there, is there was this, this live blog that was started. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with a, a live blog, but it's sort of this up-to-date information center where you can, um, and I think they used a cover it live service, um, where they can do real-time information. And this, this, um, this site ended up having reports about people being trapped, reports about people missing their family members, trying to figure out where they were. People would ask a question, does anyone know about this area? Does anyone know how to get from this area to that area? Can we access that? So real time, thousands of message were, messages were sent on this platform. And it, was, it became a super, incredibly valuable resource to the people that were there. And um, it was actually started by two journalists at this very tiny local online newspaper um, uh, called the Watershed Post, and they recruited some other journalists from other outlets, and they put together this live blog. And then they recruited, um, so they allowed locals to post, and then they recruited people from the remote crowd to help um, mediate, moderate, to, to say this goes in and that doesn't go in and everything else because they didn't have the capacity to do it. So they actually set up this really interesting crowdsource collaboration where you had information coming from one group and um, another group helping to, to process it. And we talk about them as being crowd sorcerers. We see them sort of orchestrating this effort in a really fascinating way. And one th another thing we found in this, it's really important when I talk to emergency responders, and it's something we don't always think about, was how interconnected the information space was. So we actually saw um, information on this live blog. A lot of people put it there, they found it on Facebook, they took it to the live blog. Or they, heard, they talked to someone on the phone and they entered that information to the live blog. We had an incident where we, not an incident, uh, the, the situation was the radio broadcaster would read out information that they, were, that they were seeing on the live blog, they were broadcasting that on radio. So no matter where you were, information was actually circulating in and across these different platforms. It wasn't circulating, excuse me, people were moving it. People were actively moving information from place to place to help bridge gaps in the infrastructure and access. So when we think about, where, should I use Twitter, should I use Facebook, what should I do? Yeah, you should have a good strategy, but you should also know that these information spaces are incredibly integrated and information is, is moving in and across them. 
And so these are our two, um, our two uh, big findings. We know that the, the profession of journalism is changing. It's got a lot of pressure. Um, but in this event, we saw these journalists sort of, uh, we know that, let me, let me back up, we know that people during crisis events will take on new roles and they will use their skill sets in new ways. And in this case, we saw journalists sort of evolving their role from like, I'm a reporter to I'm a crowdsourcer. I, am, I, I have these skill sets. I know how to use these platforms. I know how to recruit people. I have local expertise and I'm going to help during this event in this very particular way. Um, and the last event I want to talk about really shortly is, is Hurricane Sandy. And I want to do that because it offers some interesting um, comparison points to Seattle in this sense. Um, urban area that was densely populated. It's got uh, highly connected to, to online, uh, online spaces. People are reliant on social media. People are reliant on mobile phone connections. Um, and we saw some really interesting behavior during that event. And I want to focus on one little piece, which was people that were trying to find gas in New Jersey. And um, this is behavior we see a lot. Uh, but in this case, the people were trying to find gas, and they developed a hashtag on Twitter. And they said, hey, everybody should use this hashtag, and they started promoting it, NJ Gas. And so what people would do is they would say, hey, I just got gas here. The line was this long. The price is this. They are price gouging. They're not, pr not price gouging or whatever. And they would post that information with NJ Gas. And so if somebody wanted to find gas, all they have to do is go on Twitter, search for that hashtag, and they could see this sort of organized information space. But if you had low bandwidth, you have low battery, you need power, you need gas, that might have been tough. Here comes, a, here comes a volunteer account. So someone else who was outside the area was like, that might be hard for you. I'm going to start curating that information. So people don't have to follow the NJ gas the whole time. They just have to write me a message, and I'll go figure out where they can find gas. So we see this volunteer stuff happening, um, happening in two levels, um, where the locals, and this happens in both events, the locals are sharing and seeking real-time information about on-the-ground conditions, and then the remote crowd is providing this assistance in different ways to help the locals get the information they need at the time they need it. All right, so uh, here's, I think, why I got invited. I don't know why I got invited today, but here's what I think. I know that this, in, a, in the middle of, of the summer, if you lived in Seattle, you read this, or you heard about this, um, this article and you got really scared, or maybe you don't live in Seattle, you're thinking about moving to Seattle, you read this article, you said, no, nah, I don't really want to go there after all. Um, but it's talking about the really big one. And they're talking about what scientists call the M9 earthquake, the magnitude 9 earthquake that is overdue. Um, and and, and I, I think I was asked to think about what would we do in Seattle? What's going to happen in Seattle if this happens? And the thing is, we don't know when it's going to happen, so the technology could be very different at that time. All sorts of things could be different. We could, holy moly, we could prepare in some way and, um, and prevent some of the, the things that might happen. But let me think about what it might happen in the next few years. I got this photograph from a, um, a study, a UW study, a simulated photograph, a UW study in 2009. I think this is the viaduct falling down. Um, so I'm going to speak to this a little bit about what, what might happen in this, in this event. Um, from what I know and what I've been seeing, what's going to happen is that people are going to try to survive. And they're going to take the tools they have at, on hand, and they're going to try to work with them. They're going to work with, the, it's, people are very pro-social after disaster events. They're going to work with each other. They're going to help themselves. They're going to help others. Um, in some cases, those tools are going to be um, the platforms, uh, the, the social media technologies, other technologies we don't have yet. Um, they're going to be using some maybe new technologies that people in this room are working on. They're going to be appropriating these technologies and using them in, in ways we don't even know yet um, to try to, to, try to um, help themselves and help others. They're going to come together in networks. This network is going to be there. One of the first things I'm going to do if something happens is I'm going to start to trying to connect to these people. I know they're going to be there and they'll, they'll be willing to help me. I'm going to try to com connect to the remote crowd in any way that I can um, because I know they're going to be able to help me more than I'm going to be able to help myself. And so thinking about what we know about um, social media use during disaster events, I actually want to pose a few questions to this crowd and get you all thinking about ways that you could participate in some of this. And one of those, how do we design for emergent collaborations? Uh, in some ways, Twitter and Facebook and these things, uh, Twitter, the, the legend has it, it was designed a little bit with an emergency case in, in mind, which is why it's so useful, one of the reasons why it's so useful in that context. Um, but these platforms are already being used for this. So as we're developing other platforms, we can think, what about the emergency case? What about um, resilience during disaster events? 
one thing I really want to think about is how do we establish hyper-local social networks? So if something happens on UW campus, sad to say one of the first places I'm going to go is Yik Yak. I do never go there on a regular day. It'll ruin your faith in humanity. But it's, um, it's, uh, it's a local network, and only people in that area can be on it. And so you're able to connect in a way without the noise of the crowd and actually see what's going on. And I think it would be really useful. I'm also wondering about what's the yik yak that we can use in the future that uses sort of wireless mesh te technology that we can, we can connect with each other while the communication infrastructure is down. And how do we collaborate? And we can't just develop it and say, hey, in a disaster, you're gonna use it. You have to have technologies that people are already using for other reasons, they already know how to use, that they can easily take off the shelf and start using in new ways during disaster events. And this, this broad question is, how can we build technologies, including the tools, the platforms, and the policies to support, to support resilience during disaster? And with that, I want to thank you. Um, oh, yes, if, if I, I know some of you are the people that are out there um, doing this stuff. And if anybody wants to work with me or wants to have some advice on how you can make your technologies something that's super useful during disaster events, just let me know. Thank you very much.